Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, that's weak. That's weak. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Good morning. Ah, uh, isn't that much better? Much better. Um, I'm uh, George Benjamin. I'm the executive director at the American Public Health Association. I just want to welcome you to to our forum. Um, as you know, APHA has been striving for for over 140 years um, to try to advance the health uh, of our nation and, and, and of the people of the world. Uh, and in doing so, we've had the honor of doing some interesting things around tobacco. Um, I remind folks, we've had a formal policy to oppose tobacco since 1963, uh, and actually a um, policy against pharmacies selling tobacco since 1984. Um, and, you know, we've certainly been on the forefront on many other areas, including um, pushing for smoke-free space on airplanes, uh, workplaces, um, very, for a while, FDA regulation of tobacco. Uh, and the reason we've been interested in this is that tobacco um, is the leading preventable cause of death. Um, and there's just so much more we can do about it. I, I learned tobacco actually um, I always like to embarrass him this way, but on the knee of, of one of my colleagues uh, uh, in the audience there, Dr. Marty Wasserman, who has been an, an active advocate against tobacco for um, all of his public health career. And I just want to acknowledge you, Marty, for the work you've done over the many years that, you, um, that you've been in the, in the practice. Um, and in doing that, I've learned um, the importance of tobacco control and, and, and really how to do it right. And, you know, APHA has also been trying to walk the walk, as they say, walk the talk. Um, and since, 19, since 2004, we've encouraged um, ourselves and other groups to go and bring their money only to cities that want to be tobacco free. Um, we're going to break that rule this year, actually. We're going to be in New Orleans. And this is our first return to New Orleans since Katrina. And as you can imagine, that's one of the reasons we're going there. But while we're there, we're going to be actively helping to push uh, some anti-tobacco measures while we're there in New Orleans. Um, you know, never go into Tobacco City and create a crisis without that opportunity to try to make sure people understand the importance of tobacco control. Of course, that's why we're here today to discuss tobacco um, and really to explore how traditional and non-traditional partners can come together uh, to develop new approaches for helping Americans live tobacco-free lives. And, you know, I won't talk about the number because our next speaker is, is certainly i um, going to talk about that from his organizational perspective, and then we have an amazing opening speaker to, to, to really talk to us about this. Um, so I'm going to bring up uh, um, our uh, critical partner for this endeavor um, at CVS Health, um, Dr. Will Schrank. Will? Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Um, we're really excited to have the opportunity to be here today and to welcome you all uh, and to engage in a conversation about the role of public health interests and the private sector collaborating, working together to help make sure that all Americans are tobacco free. It's been an exciting time at CVS Health. Uh, in February, we announced that we are quitting tobacco for good, and just this month, we officially became a tobacco-free store. Thank you. And as we considered making this decision, we reached out to public health experts, um, we reached out to folks that have been spending years or generations uh, to think about what the opportunities are, what the options are. And we're very, very grateful for your support, your feedback, your participation. Uh, it's meant a great deal to us, and it's helped to create a real chorus around, a rising chorus around the importance of stores that or, or outlets that sell health, that provide health services and their role or the apparent lack of a role in selling cigarettes. 
It'll come as no surprise to the folks in this audience today that that smoking uh, continues to be the greatest source of preventable illness and death in this country, and that approximately 480,000 deaths each year are attributable to tobacco use just in this country. We spend billions and billions and billions of dollars treating these patients. There has been an extraordinary amount of work over the last several decades that's been done to really reduce the number of smokers. But as we sit here today, convincing, eliminating the use of tobacco remains our central public health concern and much, much, much more work remains to be done. We recently shared results of a study. We looked at uh, the effect of eliminating tobacco sales in two cities where there are where 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 there was there were bans on the sale of of tobacco products in all retail pharmacies, all outlets, all retailers that have pharmacies. So in both San Francisco and Boston, just in the last several years, bans were enacted that on a specific date um, there would be no further sale of cigarettes, of tobacco products, in any outlet that had a retail pharmacy. We looked at, we conducted a study where we looked at the proportion of people who smoked in those geographic regions before and after the bans. We adjusted it for states or I'm sorry, cities, Baltimore and Seattle, where no ban was in place to get a better sense of if these are trends that we saw elsewhere. And we found a substantial, a considerable reduction in the number of smokers after that ban was, in, was, was put in place, on the order of 5.5 to 13 percent reduction in the total number of smokers. If we were to extrapolate that more broadly across the country, we'd be talking about saving 25 to 60,000 lives a year. It's this inconsistency, the inconsistency of selling tobacco products, the single most harmful product that's out there in the world today, uh, in settings where we provide health care that seemed to be such a clear inconsistency to our mission. And that was what drove our decision to stop selling. We believe on this, that we're, we're on the right side of history. Last night as I was on a, a flight, I sat down and I looked to the fella to my right and I had no fear that he was going to light up a cigarette. And it really speaks to how quickly these things can change. So we hope our actions help to encourage and inspire others to think about what their role could be. We hope that it continues to engage public health interests as well as the private sector around how we collaborate and how we partner and how we work together to make this country a healthier place and one with less tobacco. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Lushniak for joining us today. We're honored and we're grateful. Um, you in particular and your office has had a really extraordinary role in the fight against tobacco, which, and I guess this has been a particularly poignant year with the 50th anniversary of the first report, the first Surgeon General's report on uh, tobacco and health. And we're really grateful to have your participation and your feedback. And in general, we're really excited that you're all here and we look forward to a day where we explore a bunch of different options and hopefully come up with something that we can all do together um, to help make sure that more Americans live tobacco-free. Thank you. Thank you, Will, and, and thank you very much to our partner at CV, partners at CVS. You know, one of the great things I get to do is, um, um, is introduce people. and. Um, you know, it's, it's always amazing. You know people, and then you get their bios or their CVs, and then you really discover you really know them. Um, so I, um, I didn't realize that our keynote speaker was from Chicago. Some of you know I am as well, um, as is 
two or three of my senior staff from Chicago. In fact, it is often said, if you want to work at APHA, you have to be from Chicago. I just want to disabuse you of that, of that fact, but it does help. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to bring up uh, um, Dr. Boris Luziniak, who's the acting United States Surgeon General. As you know, the Surgeon General's role is to articulate the best available science uh, to the public. Uh, promotes health and wellness, um, chairs the prevention council. Um, one of the more important roles, of course, is to oversee the 6,800 uniform officers of the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps. And I just, if we just want to just think about it for a moment, we are in the process of a terrible epidemic in Africa. Um, and it's often not recognized that the people that are going to be mobilized, um, in addition to the Department of Defense, uh, to fight that terrible epidemic. Many, many, many of them are members of uh, uniform um, health officers of the United States Public Health Service Corps. So if you just please give them your thoughts as they, as they go to, um, to West Africa to, to, um, to help those folks that are in, in terrible need. Um, also found out that our Surgeon General, of course, in addition to being previously the Deputy Surgeon General, um, has um, served with distinction in the Indian Health Service, um, the CDC, the FDA. Um, he got his MD degree from Northwestern University, his MPH from Harvard University. Uh, he's both a family physician um, and a dermatologist, and he's board certified both in preventive medicine and dermatology. Um, you know, he's an interesting guy in that he actually um, walks the talk. He's a long uh, distance bicyclist, runner, and hiker. Um, Admiral, I, I, I can tell you that when I was in Washington State, I used to watch. Mount Rainier um, on those days in which the sun actually came out and you could actually see the top of the mountain. Folks, I'm going to tell you, this is a gentleman who actually scaled to the summit uh, of Mount Rainier, which is about a 14,000 foot mountain. Um, I, I, I probably watched you do that, but from a, from a distance, uh, one of those days when the sun came out. Um, this January, he released the uh, um, the Health Consequences of Smoking, which is a report of the Surgeon General with 50 years of progress. Uh, as you know, we've been battling this disease um, and tobacco as a, as a vector of disease for over 50 years. And what he said in his prefix then, he said, it's my sincere hope that 50 years from now we won't need another Surgeon General's report on smoking and health because tobacco-related disease and death will be a thing of the past. Uh, working together, we can make that vision a reality. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our nation's top doc, Dr. Boris Luzinier. Thank you, Dr. Venture. Thanks. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Those of you who have heard me speak before uh, realize I don't do podiums very well. Uh, and so we've warned the videographers here that there may be some walking around. Um, Let's just start off with three simple, simple concepts. And you know, as I prepare for, for what words are going to come out of this mouth, which actually right now is like totally unpredictable, uh, is I kind of look for cues around me. And I want to start with the cue that was just right in front of me. And in essence, why we're gathered here today is really simplified by the terms put on this sign, right? We're here for science. Because part of what we're talking about is, in fact, evidence-based. It's data-driven. It's not just a feeling. It's not just an emotion that we say, you know, this whole world of burnt tobacco use, of smoking, of tobacco use in general, I don't like it because. This goes beyond that sense of, you know, the dislike of a smell, the dislike of a habit, the dislike of stained teeth. Remember when I was a kid, my brother had a, who was a, my older brother, 10 years older than I, Steve, is a staunch anti-smoker, had been a staunch anti-smoker, I think, from the womb. And we grew up in a household where my father smoked. I have a sister who smokes. The acting Surgeon General's family, yes, smokes. And the reality is I put that in front of you because that is a sign of how difficult this process is. And yet one thing I remember from my childhood was a simple sticker that he wore, which was said, saying things along the lines of kissing a smoker is like licking an ashtray. And I remember to a young kid, I thought, ooh, that's really something. 
But, but it's beyond that emotion. It, it's we're here for the science, and the science is with us on this. In the world, a 21st century world where we rely on evidence base. Ladies and gentlemen, we from all sorts of different sectors gathered here today, there's no more arguing. There, there really isn't, right? From that moment where we had the executives there in front of Congress swearing that nicotine was not addictive, that incredibly downer moment. Since then, we've had more and more truth revealed that people, in fact, were not following the science, were denying the science, were manipulating the science. So we're here for science. Science for science's sake is only numbers in a book, it's charts, it's the incredible graphics that we have, the ability to put in colors to give life to it. But science without that real next stage, which is science for action, and even the Surgeon General's report, you know, we put out the 50th anniversary report, and, and it's a great, great book. Read it. <laughs> Study it. Look at those incredible graphics. But in reality, at the end of this, those graphics just fade away with time. But unless we take that information, unless we take that science and table it, and put it out there and discuss it as we do in a forum such as today, which is what are we doing about it? What is the action that needs to be taken? I keep saying one thing that I have no problem doing and bringing to the job of being the acting Surgeon General is the sense is long gone are the days where we hide behind the science. Because there's two ways we can be doing this, right? And I'm not critical of the science. I am sci a scientist as well. But one way of doing this is, first slide, please. As you can see in table one, we now have 480,000 people who die each. No. The reality is this action now has to include another part of this. And we have many veterans of the anti-tobacco, anti-smoking movement in this room who've been doing this for a while, but it's a time that we gather around in this forum, right, with APHA and CVS Health here in the room along with the rest of us, and actually that part of this action includes two emotions. One emotion is passion. We introduced the concept of passion saying, we have the science, we have the ability to change the world, and we have to be enthusiastic and filled with this sense of accomplishing something. And there's no holding back, folks. Because the other emotion I want to introduce, which oftentimes gets confused with passion, we need to be able to hold it within us until it erupts from our souls, and that is an element of anger. You know, the scientist who sees all this, who says, you know, I'm taking this for action, who doesn't take on the aspects of passion or anger, won't accomplish the goal. Because the ultimate goal is this third component, for science, for action, for health. Now, if there is, you know, I keep using the term, a bold and noble cause, it's the health of our nation. That's why we're here today. And if you try to kind of say, oh, no, you know, I'm here from a certain angle. I'm representing an organization. I'm here from a federal group. I'm here from that. And, you know, I'm here covering a meeting. I'll report back to it. No. The reality, once again, is that everything that goes on in this room today has a focus on the health of the nation. And I embrace the World Health Organization definition of health, which is a complex, awe-inspiring definition. And that is that health is the complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So if you really 
want to get blown away. Look at that definition. And those of you in public health, my latest recommendation is I recommend you put two things on your bulletin boards at work. Put down the World Health Organization definition of health to inspire you each and every day saying that's the ultimate. That's what we're trying to achieve. The next thing I recommend you put on there, and this is where I think we need to be reminded that things are achievable. And I refer to the MMWR back in 1999 that listed the 10 major accomplishments in public health in the 20th century. Because in that list of 10 is a reminder that although on a daily basis, we in public health, we in government, we in the private sector who are dealing with health issues may feel as if, oh, the odds are against us. No, that list of 10 proves the sense that things are accomplishable. And one of those 10 is recognition of tobacco as a health hazard. That's one of the top 10. Because certainly in the year 1900, we lived in a different world. In the year 1950, we lived in a different world. But by 1964, we began a new era, one that we commemorate this year in this 50th anniversary year. It's a commemoration that allows us to look back in time to January 1964 when the report is released that has a very simple conclusion. And I keep telling people, I love the subtlety of these words, because it is. It's so government ease to some extent. You know, did they want to rock the boat? Well, they didn't realize how much the boat was going to be rocked by this simple term. And the simple sentence was, cigarette smoking is a health hazard of sufficient importance in the United States. No? Get ready, man, sit down. To warrant appropriate remedial action. That's the conclusion. And, and I'm not making fun of that statement. In fact, I am awed by that statement. Because in the subtlety of those words, appropriate remedial action began a 50-year process which has changed the world, has presented a dif different, different look at our social norms, has taken something that was so prevalent and so thought of as being just a part of society to now, 50 years later, a short 50 years, realizing that we are on the winning team in this room. We are on the winning team, and let's be proud of that. Is the game over? Is the battle won? No, it is not. We don't accept the successes we've had because we know in the midst of this, we still have a lot of work to do. Two recent events in my life, and I sort of want to put into perspective because I want to tell you how this issue is still out there. Last week, we were in New Mexico. The Surgeon General travels a lot. I, I hate traveling. Uh, you know, getting on another airplane, being away from home. It, it's, you know, I had an era when I was with CDC, always on the road. I was young. I was alive. This was great. I still feel young and alive. But, you know, but the reality is I realize the job now comes with that obligation. And each and every time, once I get on the road, Lieutenant Annetta, my new assistant, knows, is, you know, I tell her, you know, I just want to go home, get me home, just get me home, I don't want to do this. And then I get in front of the crowd and I realize I have a job to do as the Surgeon General of the United States. And one of those jobs last week in New Mexico was going to an elementary school. First stop, four stops in 24 hours. First is an elementary school, Bandelier Elementary School outside Albuquerque. It tied in with our skin cancer prevention call to action recently because the school has done incredible things. Right, the school put up shade, gives little kids hats, they're out there sunscreen. So we were there for that reason. Our time period with the kids was with the fifth graders. The fifth graders there are the big kids on campus. This is elementary school, they are the seniors. And they were so proud of the fact that they were the example for the kindergartners. There's a ritual, kindergartners come into that school, they're given a wide brim hat that they wear throughout their year. Fifth graders. So I talk the skin cancer talk, and then afterwards, what happens? We have Q's and A's. 
to tell you how this issue has not gone away. These are fifth graders. I'm there to talk about skin cancer. And we had a few skin cancer questions. But then, from the mouths of the fifth graders, uh, tell me again about smoking. My mom, my dad, my grandparents smokes. What do I tell them? You know, there's lots of kids who still smoke. And, and it was interesting, and Lieutenant Annette will be the first to admit to this, this got derailed off of topic, but in fact, it didn't feel like a derailment. Because if a fifth grader turns to me saying, you, Surgeon General, have not done enough, right? You are still presenting me, a fifth grader, a dilemma here. It's a reminder of, oh my God, this is from the mouth of these kids who are soon going to be in middle school. We know the stats with middle school. This is where it starts, who are going to be the high schoolers, who are seeking that information. If you think there's no interest out there, I invite you to go to the fifth grade of Bandelier Elementary School and do the talk. Focus a few days later, down at North Carolina, the heart of tobacco country, giving a talk on tobacco. You know, talk about being empowered, thinking again how our lives have changed. First of all, I made it to North Carolina safe and sound, and I returned from North Carolina safe and sound. But in the midst of that, talking with the North Carolina Public Health Association was an important endeavor, because there you see people in the front lines in a historically pro-tobacco state who are making headway. On stage, one of the lobbyists talking about her role and her organization's role in terms of trying to get the state legislature to look at the tobacco tax. An issue in North Carolina. I think it's 48 cents a pack. The national average is a buck 53. They're behind the times. And here they're trying to do that, knowing that taxes play a key role in terms of people getting off tobacco. On stage, a person who admits they're not a public health person. They're not even a health person. What is he? He's the manager of multi unit housing, he's a realtor. And yet that organization has gone 100% tobacco free in their units. And part of it was, it makes business sense. Yes, the repercussions are, it plays a role in the health of the nation, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, he said, that's what the public wants. Even in North Carolina, that's what they want. And certainly looking at the decision making of CVS Health, I would love to say you come in totally altruistic into this. And I know there is that mission and passion for public health. But at the end of the day, your people running the numbers said, yeah, we're going to take a hit here. But ultimately, we're changing. Right? We're changing a philosophy that ultimately it's what the public wants. And I think that's what the discussion here needs to be is at the end of all this, we can't be in a position of saying, oh, woe be me, this is not attainable. You look at that list of 10, those 10 achievements in the 20th century. You look at the concept of what we can do, what we already have done. But in the midst of this, we have so much more that needs to get done. So where do we start? Well, we start with a multi-unit housing unit outside of Wilmington, North Carolina. That's where we start. We start with the Department of Defense that's now beginning to say, oh, you know, I'm starting to get this, guys. The fact that most of their medical units are now gone tobacco-free. We're still not 100%. Their public health command has gone completely tobacco. This is in an environment where, once again, we think of the social norm being that's what a soldier does. We start infiltrating to have people start scratching their heads, to have them run those business models. Part of what DOD is interested in is two things, a national security objective, which is they want healthy people coming in. You know, I'm always amazed that with the DOD, they don't allow smoking during basic training. 
They bring them in saying, we're going to mold you into the soldiers of the future. No smoking. You know, to realize how incredible that is, and yet once that's done, it sort of said, okay, guys, back to being normal again. It's okay. There's a disconnect, but one that I feel is going to be connected. Healthy Base Initiative, part of the DOD perspectives. You know, how can they look at their group that they're in charge of? Not only the, the, the people in uniform, but their family members. Yes, part of it is the costs associated. When you run the numbers of how much health care is expended in the DOD system for smoking-related diseases, that's another way. I don't care what your reason is. The sense is, at the end, we have the science, we need to have action, and we're doing it for the health of individuals. Partnerships, housing and urban development, EPA, ARC is in the room. You know, we have multiple partnerships that exist there. But even from the, the, the U.S. government perspective, the ability for us to look at the housing units that's operated by HUD and saying how many are going smoke-free. The ability to infiltrate college campuses, realizing that part of the you know, tobacco-free college campus initiative is now going from 700 colleges to, to 1,400 almost that are going tobacco-free. That's how we start this. You look at a small service. Thank you for the kind regards to the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. This year celebrating its 125th anniversary of being a uniform service in these United States. And you're right. Part of my team is sitting at Hubert Humphrey right now, putting, in to the, putting together the teams that will soon go out to Liberia to assist in that incredible public health crisis. But in the midst of that, this is also a service that proudly, on January 1st, shortly before the commemoration of the 50th anniversary, and shortly before the release of the 50th anniversary report, under the signature of then Surgeon General Regina Benjamin, who had signed this policy a year earlier to go into effect on January 1st, implemented humbly by me, it's the fact that we became the first service of all the services to go tobacco-free, e-cigarette-free, while in uniform. And you would think, you would think that the Public Health Service Commission Corps would have done this years ago. We didn't. We saved it until the 50th anniversary year so that we can say, and for you. right. So, you know, it's, but it's one of those things where now we turned, you know, what a great place to be in this building where we see pictures of officers around us, right? The Reserve Officers Association, incredible historic building incredible activism. We're now inspiring the other services, which is, you want to talk about health? You want to talk about example? You want to talk about patriotism? Let's tie all this together. I submit to you that we can wave many different flags under the aspect of tobacco-free America. And one of those flags is the patriotic flag. I strongly believe that we need to treat health as a national natural resource and preventable diseases in particular need to be targeted that if it's preventable then we blew it and even one person getting lung cancer from tobacco one person developing diabetes because of tobacco one getting colorectal cancer any of those maladies that we now know strike every single organ system of the body, that's how bad it is. From one cancer in 64 to 13 cancers now, but that add in other things. If we can prevent one individual from getting those diseases, that is a positive for the economy of the nation. That is a positive for the morale of the nation that is a positive for the productivity of the nation, that is a positive for the happiness of the nation. So let's start talking about a national natural resource. And let's blend in whatever flag you want to wave. You want to wave the Public Health Association flag and continue your excellent work? Do so in this incredible But You want to wear the CVS? Health lapel pin, you're part of the team. 
You want to wave the American flag and saying this is good for our nation? Join us. Because for too long, I think, we've disregarded health as a key component to our nation. For too long, we've treated it as a secondary phenomenon, as an individual decision point. You want to be healthy or not? No, go back to the WHO definition. That's health. And these things are attainable. Are we ever going to get rid of all sickness and disease and injuries? No. We're never going to get there. But can we make a dent in terms of the preventables? Yes. And certainly when it comes to tobacco use, as already stated, the number one, I mean, this is it. This is the number one. 480,000 people a year die prematurely from cigarette smoke, from tobacco-related diseases. We done good enough? Yeah, well, let's just stop. 18% of our population smokes. It's down from 43%. You know, the numbers look good. Surgeon General, just, you know, go, yep, 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 yep. just do whatever you need to do. That's, that's 5.6 million kids currently alive who die prematurely. The inroads are being made. If we can show up in North Carolina, inspire the public health workers there, and we inspire them not, I mean, I would love to say when I go out there to inspire them with a checkbook. Here, here's more funding for your tobacco cessation program. Here's more. No, the reality is we are in hard economic times. The inspiration now has to be one of saying we're 50 years into this. It remains a bold and noble cause. And we can do this. We can make a difference. And as already stated, you know, 50 years from now, oh, we have a Surgeon General's report that has this great cover. The Surgeon General at the time will come out and make speeches, and it'll all be a historical vignette of how bizarre our culture was that we allowed for this. Certainly the 75th anniversary report, my expectation is we have zeros in there, that we have certain groups that are already saying, we've gone tobacco free. It's OK. Right? It, it's doable. So at the end of all this, what are we trying to do today? We're going to have discussions. We're going to have panels. But at the end of today, we go out and we start with what we started, remembering the fifth graders at Bandelier Elementary School and their inquisitiveness, their concern. We remember that we're talking about science, but that's not enough because that science needs to be put into an action phase to do something about it. And ultimately, that attainable goal of the health of our nation. Let's have a great day doing that. But let's walk away invigorated. Let's walk away reset on our path, on our mission. And let's walk away being friends, realizing that although we have multiple interests and groups we represent in this room, but the common bond of ours is, in fact, what we, the Commission Corps, have taken on years ago as our motto, but it's not just exclusive to us. Because, ladies and gentlemen, what we're doing in this room is we're following that mission, and that mission is to protect, promote, and advance the health and safety of our nation. That's how big today is. Thank you so much for your attention. And we can take a few questions. Yeah, I never used notes, and I decided to use this because I thought this looks intellectual, didn't it? <laughs> So my name is Renata Henry, and I work for a SAMHSA-funded Addiction Technology Transfer Center here. And um, given the World Health Organization uh, definition of health, mental is in there. And what we know is that um, we have a really disparate population of those with mental illness and substance use disorders that still smoke at a rate of about 40 percent, 43 percent of those individuals. So um, our efforts to continue to reduce smoking in this country are really dependent 
on really reaching that population and reducing smoking in that population in a major way. So one of the things that I would like to see happen is, um, I know there's been a lot of focus. I know you work closely with the Smoking Cessation Leadership Center out at the University of San Francisco with uh, Dr. Schroeder. Um, but we need to do more because that group still um, mm -hmm. smokes. And with the prescription drug abuse epidemic, one in five individuals in this country in any given year have a behavioral health condition diagnosable. Um, without impacting that population, uh, we won't drive it down. And I agree. I think, again, we're at that phase half a century into this where really the strategy now is, if we really are, you know, tobacco free generation, in a generation, whatever numbers you want to use. Certainly we look at the youth as being our savior and that we can influence that. We're not giving up, however, on any of the high-risk groups. And the reality is, you know, I mean, I'm in the uniform service. It's an unarmed service. I'm not a person who goes out and shoots guns, right? I've spent a quarter century in this uniform proudly wearing it, knowing that I'm an unarmed service. But I will put out that analogy of war. We go to war to battle. And we have strategies in that battle. And ultimately, the phase that we're switching into is as opposed to sort of saying we're on all-out war, we really have to change the phase now to basically saying what are the high-risk groups, what are the influential groups. We are smart enough. We have the data. Simon has the data. CDC has the data. You all have the data. Now, the concerted effort that I think we need to get into is exactly that. Where are my problem areas akin to a battlefront, right? And how do I not send battalions against that, but how do I infiltrate? How do I do that? How do I make this actually work effectively with the least number of resources going into that? That's what it's all about. Because right now, we know where our problem areas are. And you're absolutely right. In the world of mental illness, in the world of substance abuse, we have a problem area. So the question is, how do we do that? You know, we know what tobacco cessation modalities work. But they may have to be changed in that world. Because what I have is I now have a person suffering with other maladies. And the question is, is the processing different? Is the ability for me to influence different? I have to know a little bit more about what's going to work in that population. Do you have a question? And I just think it's you know, critical to know that that population also has high rates of other chronic illness that co occur. Well, Absolutely. I mean, you look at that, and last week I was on Capitol Hill testifying on, on prevention of suicide. You know, and you look at that, you know, the mental health crisis is tied in to so many different aspects of preventable public health issues in this country. Thank you for a very inspiring talk. Um, this is Tamara Riga from the School of Pharmacy, University of Maryland. Uh, when we talk about um, preventing the next generation of tobacco users and targeting children who are susceptible to advertising and to images, especially in the media. We know that that influences them greatly, even though it may be unpaid advertisement that they're viewing that uh, when they're in the movies and they see an actor they like smoking, that can change their behavior and turn them into smokers. What are your thoughts about uh, having warnings um, so that children can see these before they view a movie, that they right. can be informed that this is Yeah, I think there's such an important role. And again, we've learned so much more about those influencers, specifically on youth. And the issue is, I mean, who else saw, I don't know, was the Academy Awards or something with the close-ups of, of all the actors now using e-cigarettes? And my heart sank, right? When you say, oh my God, now, you know, there's gonna be a lot more, right? But in the midst of all this, I mean, one of the things that we're, we're looking at, and, and it's been a proposal from, from sectors out in California, which is you look at the influences. And this is documented. This goes back to this. This isn't a feeling that I have. Oh, because you show a cigarette on the screen, that someone's going to think about initiation of smoking. No, this is science. We know that influences kids. And the reality is we are looking at mechanisms. I mean, one of the things that we would like to have a more vibrant discussion is the rating system of movies, for example, right? Right now, if you show illicit drug use in a movie, somebody mainlining, somebody doing that, somebody smoking marijuana, it automatically becomes an R rating. The reality is, well, can we put cigarettes in that same world? You know, the sense out there is, you know, it's maybe not the perfect answer, 
but it's the answer where I think we need to be going in this world of this next 25 years of activism, which is let's look at what's out there, let's look at what works. Certainly the influencers out there, be they in the world of sports or be they in the world of, of you know, the Hollywood scene, the TV scene, we know they play incredible roles in terms of influencing the young. And once again, that needs to be a concerted effort to kind of say, hey, listen, what can we do? Hi, Lori Adams with the Baby and Me Tobacco Free Program, and we're helping pregnant women quit smoking and stay quit. And we've been able to help over 5,000 pregnant moms quit and have healthy babies born on time. So my question is, our program uses an incentive-based process where a mom will get free diapers for a year if she stays quit, and we're testing her. And that's not a traditional partnership that we've always uh, often seen um, our public health entity go. We, we often see that they're not incentivizing as much, whereas we can see now a public-private partnership action could help more. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on an incentive-based project. Well, certainly, uh, you know, there's no one answer to any of this, right? I mean, and, and it really falls into the realm of, of public health, you know, implementation of public health activities in general. There's never one answer. Right? Yeah, and we simplify things. You know, the concept of the stick and the carrot, what works? The answer is yes, both work. Because if I call the stick a regulatory approach to this, if I call a stick taxation of cigarettes approach, right, then in essence is, guess what? These things work. Certainly the new role that the Food and Drug Administration has taken on as of 2009 with the Tobacco Control Act, right? That is going to be stick-like endeavors. And yet, in the midst of all this, you know, when we look at this, the idea incentives built in, whether it's incentives built in for general health, right? We know premiums can be lower. We know certain industries are awarding or rewarding their people who take on healthy lifestyles. You know, that's part of the puzzle. I think this is a very innovative program that you have in an area that, once again, you know, we know we're behind on. Right? I mean, some of the statistics that we've seen recently in terms of the you know, percentage of pregnant women who still smoke, what is it, Simon, 43% in West Virginia along those lines? 30%. 30%. I mean, could you imagine that somehow we still have a full third? And, and most of them are getting some sense of prenatal care. It's not that there's no care going on. But the sense is somewhere we're broken here because somewhere is a health care provider who basically says, oh, you know, fine, you're a smoker, you shouldn't smoke. Next, right? And that's not good enough anymore. I see Dr. Benjamin is getting nervous on time, so. Yeah, Mike. Right. There's a mic there for you. Oh, thank you. Um, I congratulate you. I'm the one who said go CVS <laughs> because I think it's splendid that you have changed your business model to one of health promotion rather than give the customer whatever they want and they're willing to pay for. Uh, and Rebecca Trochi, my colleague from ARC, and I, as we came down from Rockville on Metro, we were talking about CVS. Uh, because every week I stop at CVS at, at 5.30 in the morning <laughs> because it's open 24 hours and I talk to a, a clerk who works there part time and, he, and it was wonderful when the whole wall of tobacco products was gone, replaced by, by uh, tobacco cessation aids. But my friend who's uh, an immigrant from Mali and he's been in this country for seven years. Five years after he got here, he became an American citizen. He said in Mali, he never voted, but in this country, he voted, he's voted in every single uh, election since then. But uh, Mr. Musa told me that, that he's not going to, his hours are being cut back because CVS revenues are down because of no tobacco sales. And so Rebecca and I were talking about ways that CVS could uh, replace that revenue stream by becoming more active in health promotion, in getting uh, customers, clients who carry your CVS card, because I've got it with me every day, uh, 
help uh, perhaps pre prepare some kind of model that people would encourage people to become more physically active. Maybe a 10,000 step a day program. Maybe, you know, give, so, give us pedometers So, so one something. question might be for, for the Surgeon General to, um, to um, talk a little bit about the role of the private sector in health promotion activities. Right, right. right. Thank you. And I think, again, this is, a, you know, the sense is that this is a multi-sectored approach, right? And, and the approach is, yes, it's all perhaps surrounding a potentially a business model, but that business model is one that needs to be encouraged and one that can work. Right? At the end of the day, no business wants to make a decision that ultimately decreases revenues. Every decision has to have a bottom dollar that says it's either going to decrease it and we're going to regain it, or we're going to have some sense of stability, or we're going to get the public relations aspect that allows people to come in. Right? I mean, let's be honest. Right? It's not strictly a medical health only decision. The sense is we look at CVS Health as being an example of a group that's gone out there, a group that we want to continue to have interactions with, not, if nothing else, to show as an example to others, saying, listen, much like the Commission Corps says to the big services, the ones with the real guns and the real budgets and all that, you know, look at what we did, come follow us. The sense is, you know, I want the CVS Health out there saying, hey, this is doable, folks. But again, the flag that we wave is different. But at the end of the day, you know, let's bring in that patriotic flair. At the end of the day, the common bond is he may have the CVS flag and I may have the public health service flag or the Surgeon General's flag. But above it all, let's get patriotic here, folks. We're waving an American flag and health has a major impact on the future of our nation. Right? That's the reality. Ladies and gentlemen, our, our nation's top doc, Dr. Boris Lujanet. Great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. I'm going to bring up our panel, and while I'm doing that, I'm going to introduce our moderator. Um, our moderator today is Dr. Um, Lyndon Havlin. Um, she's well known in the field of, um, of global health. Uh, she holds both some master's and doctoral degrees in public health, and also has completed advanced uh, management and leadership training at the Harvard Business School. She has over 25 years of experience in both domestic and international public health, and has led numerous uh, public health campaigns, initiatives, and organizations. Um, she's been an advisor of global leaders, presidents, and agency heads on a whole range of activities, maternal child health, access to vaccines, HIV AIDS, um, tobacco control and health um, promotion and disease prevention. Um, she's also um, been a, a former member of the executive board of the American Public Health Association and, and just an absolute friend of public health. Um, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Havlin, who introduced our panel, and uh, um, there you go. Great. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, George. It's, it's an honor to be here, and it's on, an honor to join with such a distinguished panel in talking about how together we can create the healthiest nation ever. The people that I, I'm about to introduce to you all have an essential role to play. And I think one of the questions that the Surgeon General left us with, which was, he, he asked us to think if we need inspiration to look at what were the top 10 accomplishments of public health in the last century. And so I guess my, the question I would lay in front of each of our panelists today is how can we make the eradication of tobacco use in America the number one accomplishment in the first part of this new century? So that would be one key question. I also think it was lovely to have the Surgeon General remind us of the essential role that APHA plays in pulling together advocates, business, foundations, and being at the center of cross-sectoral work in public health, in promoting the health of the nation. So with that, I will introduce our panelists and then tell you a little bit about how we're going to do this. Each of our panelists will speak briefly. We're getting people who are watching us um, on a live uh, webcast, and they are tweeting. And I would encourage anyone who's on social media to please tweet um, hashtag APHA tobacco. You can also hashtag um, APHA Tobacco, your questions, um, and we'll get those questions from uh, Susan Polin, our uh, director in the back. So first, um, I guess to my right, uh, is Sherry Davidson. And I like to say that everyone comes to tobacco with a story. Just, and Sherry's story is a, story is a deep story of family health and tobacco. 
Um, she has an essential role as she's the vice president of the National Business Group on Health. So a question for Sherry would be, how does how do businesses think about tobacco, both in amongst the people who they work with and the people that they sell to. Um, she works, um, her job is devoted exclusively to representing large employers um, on national health policy issues. So I think Sherry will have a very interesting perspective. Next to Sherry is Tom Menahan. Now, he has the, the joy of working all the way down at the other end of the mall, working for the national, um, the American Pharmacists Association. And one of the questions we have always in tobacco control asked ourselves that CVS has thankfully answered for us, which is why on earth do pharmacists work in a place where they sell tobacco? And so thank you, CVS, for helping us solve the question, which is there is no place <laughs> for pharmacists to be selling tobacco. So we'll, it'll be very exciting to hear about the role of what are the, what's the pharmacist's role in this next century of tobacco control. And then finally, the far end of the panel, a man who needs no introduction in tobacco control is my friend and colleague, Matt Myers. Matt has been involved with tobacco control, I think, since the earth cooled. There is no bit of tobacco control that he, he hasn't had his well. hands on, <laughs> his passion behind, and his strategic thinking. And so I will say a very warm welcome to my friend and colleague, Matt Myers. Um, and then at the end, we want to have all of you join us in this conversation. So with that, I think I'm going to just um, ask Matt to kick us off. Well, uh, thanks very much. And it's a real pleasure to be here. You know, um, Dr. Lushniak really did hit the core facts. Um, as much progress as we have made. And tobacco is probably this nation's greatest public health victory. Um, unless we do more, 5.6 million children alive today will die from tobacco. 3,000 kids today will light up for the first time. 700 kids today will become confirmed addicted smokers. The good news is there is no issue where we have demonstrated scientifically that we know how to make the fundamental change that's necessary. The bad news is that we haven't demonstrated the political will, the ability to bring together all sectors of our society to finish the job. Um, Dr. Lushniak said um, that his goal is to come together 50 years from now and talk about tobacco as history. Well, we can't wait 50 years. Um, we can't wait 15 years. When we have a solution and know how to do it and don't do it, then we have to look at ourselves and ask the core question, why? You know, the bad news is as well that the disparities today are huge. Who smokes is largely a function of socioeconomic class and education. It's at high-risk populations, as we heard, both you know, the mentally ill, LGBT community, Native Americans. It's geographic. Where you live today will have a direct relationship on your risk of dying of lung cancer, heart disease, diabetes, unnecessarily. And it's not just which state you live in today. You know, as recent data has shown, you know, Virginia, for example, Fairfax um, County has among the lowest smoking rates and the highest life expectancy in the United States but go down just the road to Petersburg, Virginia, and you have both among the highest smoking rates and the lowest life expectancy. What it says is that we have tools, but we haven't applied them. And we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to do that? So for me, it's a pretty critical question. Um, if we know that raising taxes is the quickest, most effective way to reduce tobacco use, we know that it generates needed revenue for government programs. We know that it affects every one of those populations. Why aren't we doing it? If we know that going smoke-free produces an immediate reduction in cardiovascular disease, it changes the social norm for our children, how is it that we can tolerate any community that does that? If we know from the report that Dr. Lushniak released this year 
that 50 years after the first report of the Surgeon General, cigarettes today are not only not safer, but they more than double your risk of lung cancer? How would we allow any, any industry in the world, once it learns that its product is a killer, to double its killing rate? Um, and yet today, for the first time, the FDA has the power and authority to ensure that tobacco companies can't make their products more addictive, can't make them more um, toxic, and can't make them more appealing. And if we as citizens don't demand that the FDA use that authority, then there is something wrong. It's our mistake, not their mistake. And lastly, we have failed to properly and enthusiastically embrace the private sector. The key to what CVS has done is it has shown that corporate leadership can change the public dialogue. The impact of CVS's courageous decision is not just that CVS will go smoke free, but that we are asking fundamental questions about what the private sector can do that we have simply not asked. And I think there's a critical question that all of us as citizens have to answer. And I think CVS has helped us define it. We need to define what a responsible retailer is in our society. And I put to you that it's all of our responsibility to say a, no res a responsible retailer in our society doesn't sell tobacco products, whether they're a pharmacy, a convenience store, a gas station, or a box store. And what will change that public dialogue? It's how we act with our feet and our dollar and our organization. Um, and I think we have as a society to say, if we really believe that the definition of a responsible retailer is a retailer that doesn't sell tobacco, that puts the health of its community before its short-term profits, then we need to make sure that every retailer gets that message. And we need to do it with more than rhetoric. We need to do it with how we as individuals, how we as organizations interact with the private sector. We need to reward those who do the right thing so that doing the right thing is good business as well as good policy. That's the way our society works. So when you ask what are our priorities, among those needs to be to ensure that the private sector that steps forward is embraced not only with our rhetoric, but with our actions and our day-to-day -day actions. And I think that's incredibly important in what we need to do. So we need to embrace the private sector in a way we haven't. We need to ensure that it's not just CVS that is sending a message to the entire nation that says, if you care about your kids, you can't sell tobacco products. But even more than that, and, and, and I congratulate CVS for doing this as well, is it's one thing to make a business decision. It's another thing to recognize that every private sector business in this country operates in a community. And you won't have healthy workers. You won't have productive workers if you don't become engaged in the public policy actions in your community to engage in that. And we have seen that with CVS. They have shown real leadership in that respect as well. To speak out in favor of the public policies that will ensure it's not just that their customers, but every child in the communities in which they work are protected, that they go to schools that promote proper education, that they live in communities where kids are not exposed to secondhand smoke from cigarettes or e-cigarettes um, in any form of those whatsoever. And we need as a community to embrace those organizations that step out and do that. I don't think um, it is an overstatement to say that with the reduction in smoking rates we have seen in just the last 15 years, smoking rates among teenagers have gone from over 36 percent to under 16 percent. That it is wrong to say that if we finish this decade and still have smoking rates among our kids in double digits, we have failed, they haven't failed. Um, and that we will only succeed with the kind of public-private partnership that CVS has demonstrated we're capable of doing if we embrace business and ensure that business understands that it's in their economic interest as well as their good-hearted interest, that we can get to that goal. Now, the last thing is um, I want to say is Dr. Lushniak spoke about passion and anger. I would say 
we need to add two things to that, and that's discipline and focus. Um, we need to, to use the proven, scientifically demonstrated strategies and ensure they are applied with the force that the science demonstrates they um, justify in this case. We can't look back and say, we knew how to solve this problem, but we simply didn't get off our seats and demand the proper action. Uh, there is an energy for this, and it's in every single state. It doesn't matter whether it's a conservative state or a um, liberal state, a northern state or a southern state. The public supports tobacco control, and political figures will take the actions necessary when we in our communities unite with the private sector and adopt those policies. You know, there's a CVS store right near the high school near my, uh, near my home. And in the morning, you see the kids pour in there, and in the afternoon, you see the kids pour in there. Three months ago, what they saw was a background of cigarettes every single day when they walked in there. And we know that much of cigarette sales among youth is spontaneous buying, reinforced by the view that everybody in society does because they see cigarettes everywhere. When CVS removed the cigarettes from its store, it changed the daily stimuli that a thousand kids got every single day. Suddenly cigarettes were no longer the norm in their community. Suddenly there was no longer the temptation. The adults in the community who had quit smoking were no longer tempted every time they walked in the store because the cues were exactly the opposite. So no one should make any mistake. The impact of withdrawing the visibility of cigarettes as well as the accessibility of cigarettes on our community, on our kids, and on people who are making a good faith effort to change their life is enormous. So we know not only need an oath, oh, th um, thanks to a company like CVS, we need to ensure that every other retailer, starting with pharmacists and then moving down, you know, convenience stores, they're the heart and soul of our community. You can't be the heart and soul of our community and not care about the kids in our community. So when you sell cigarettes, you're not the heart and soul of my community, I can tell you that one. And we're not going to support you, and we're going to make sure that we do everything we can to communicate to a wide breadth as possible, mothers, fathers, grandmothers. If you care about the kids, then you will reward those retailers who care about the kids. And you will say clearly to the local convenience store, to the local 7-Eleven, to the local gas station, you can't tell us that you're part of our community unless you take actions that demonstrate you care about our community. Great, thank you. Matt. <laughs> so, so Matt's left us a challenge, which of course he is wont to do, which is how do, we, how do we promote this idea of responsible retailing, and what are we going to do, and what's the role of pharmacists? Because not all pharmacists are, are lucky enough to work for CVS. So there are many pharmacists mm -hmm. spread across the country who are scratching their heads a little bit and saying, how can I be an activist for change? So, Sure. Well, thank you. And thanks to uh, AP Big H A uh, <laughs> for organizing this important event and for including pharmacists on your team. Um, 50 years ago, a brave Surgeon General identified smoking for the health risk that it is. And for more than four decades, the American Pharmacists Association, founded in 1852, has applauded and recognized the science uh, and the pharmacies who have never sold or have made the decision to stop selling tobacco products. Uh, indeed, our organization has extensive anti-smoking policy. Uh, recently, efforts by our current Surgeon General uh, and CVS have reinvigorated the action agenda with the public and I can tell you from my conversations, the CVS pharmacists love it. They are so proud of their company. Uh, as that conversation grows, uh, I'd like to offer America's pharmacists as an underutilized resource located in problem areas in the fight to stop smoking. Increasingly, well-trained pharmacists engage in the provision of smoking cessation programs. These programs effectively influence smoking cessation by patients with not just medication or nicotine replacement therapy, but also coaching on mod behavior modification and other support. Increasingly, schools of pharmacy are training student pharmacists the skills to help smokers quit. 
Patients may pay out of pocket, but a growing number of employers cover these services provided by pharmacists. There are currently five state Medicaid programs that support programs for beneficiaries to receive services from pharmacists, including Alabama, Alaska, Indiana, Delaware, and Nebraska. But to date, access to pharmacist services is not provided under Medicare unless provided while the smoker is in their physician's office. Despite this limited coverage, an increasing number of pharmacists are trained and engaged in smoking cessation. One great, very passionate example is APHA member Dr. Beth Martin. In her managed care practice in the early 1990s, she and her colleagues assessed the impact of nicotine replacement therapy. In the process, they learned that the key to success was a combination of therapeutic and behavioral approaches. Simply, they found that assisting patients throughout their quit journey using cessation aids and tailored counseling, counseling to help them manage triggers was the most effective approach. Later, when Dr. Martin joined the University of Wisconsin, the State Tobacco Control Board gave the school funding to support community pharmacists in a pilot program to train on the pharmacology of nicotine and addiction, as well as what therapies to use for specific quitters. These pharmacists got used to talking with patients about NRT and other agents, as well as behavioral modification and changes. Smokers who expressed interest in quitting were enrolled. Initially, the programs targeted adolescents, and the team quickly learned that for this group, money was not the sole motivator. In fact, peer group engagement was an effective te technique to keep these folks engaged, often meeting at the pharmacy after hours to support one another in the process. Another effort involved a large health system and employer group in Madison where the employer's HR department knew that 80% of their workforce smoked. A healthcare team used peer support along with pharmacists to help with meds and monitoring dosing, dealing with potential side effects and coaching patients individually and in groups. Behavioral aspects such as trigger identification and mindfulness are emphasized. Smokers spend two to four weeks in preparation for their quit date. By that time, they've gained keen awareness of triggers and have the confidence and motivation to quit. Triggers such as stress, arguments, meals, or a favorite chair are all typical reasons for smokers. Once smokers realize they don't need tobacco, the game is on and the quitting begins. Team support remains important in the, in the workplace through peers, even when the pharmacist coaches are not around. And there's an active alumni group known as BEATNIC B-E-A-T-N-I-C, that meets once a month to serve as bright spots for those in the process of quitting. Other incentives, including employer support of time and copay adjustments, are also key. What about results? In large part because the programs I've described begin with folks who have identified a desire to quit, success rates are in the 40 to 45 percent range after six months. And this has been sustained in various programs since 2001. Unfortunately, uh, for the, for the non-employer-based programs, when funding runs out, the program simply can't continue. Pharmacists who provide these services have been trained in behavior change behavior in behavior change principles, and they know that it's critical to identify folks ready to quit before enrolling them. Knowing that quitters often take several attempts to quit, these programs are offered on an unlimited basis for six months to allow enrollees to continue if they aren't successful in their first attempt. Quitters learn more each time they try, and the tobacco cessation service is there when they're ready to try again. Great, thank you. Um, so Tom is talking about a really essential role, which has been, and I think for many in tobacco control, we do believe that pharmacists have been an untapped resource. <clears throat> They've been ready, willing, and able, but we haven't really had a great role for them. So we're excited to hear um, that there are some great innovations out there and that people are stepping up. But now um, we, we turn to Sherry, and Sherry has a very interesting um, take on this, especially if we start with Matt's question of what is responsible retailing and how will we get there? And so, Sherry, why don't you take it away? Sure. Well, and thanks again for inviting me to come. Um, I represent the National Business Group on Health, 
where um, I handle the, our Institute on Healthcare Costs and Solutions, which includes a committee on evidence-based benefit design, which has large employers, strategic partners, as well as public and uh, private researchers and agencies. Mm -hmm. And so we spend a lot of time looking at science and trying to help large employers determine how to cover them. But um, he, what I wanted to talk about today is I joined the business group a year and a half ago at my dream job, having come from a large employer and been on the large employer side for most of my career. Um, because the business group had long supported our nearly 400 large employer members, which represents 55 million employees, dependents, and retirees, on tobacco cessation. So we've supported employers in putting in programs, comprehensive programs, like uh, financial supports, cessation aids, counseling and medication, um, and created toolkits for our members to learn how to do that. So uh, in, the most, in, in the last year, we've created um, a, a just the facts on e-cigarettes. We've done a survey of large employers and how they're handling the e-cigarette situation. We've created a forum for discussions. Last week, we had um, a user group that talked about what to do with smoking huts on their facilities, how to repurpose them to meditation rooms or things of that nature. Um, and we've also highlighted, including CVS, large employers doing really exciting things in the space of tobacco cessation. So our view is that all employers should support these actions. And gratifyingly, most of our members, the large employers, uh, which include uh, about two-thirds of the Fortune 100, um, 95 percent, no, I'm sorry, 93 percent of our members mentioned that they offer smoking cessation programs, which is up from 66 percent in 2009. So I work with the HR department and the benefit department of these large employers, not necessarily the folks that decide whether to sell or not sell tobacco, but they look at their, themselves as a community of employees. Um, so large employers, in fact, were some of the earliest to ban smoking on their properties and in company vehicles including treating e-cigarettes like any other tobacco product. In fact, in our survey, 95% treat them exactly the same. In 2015, this is a recent survey that we just um, released, more than half of companies will ban tobacco on outside of their facility, on their campus, um, and you know, outside the building, so you have to go off campus, and 7% plan to ban hiring smokers where that's legal. 58% um, of companies expect to use some sort of incentive. Um, most, three times, are more likely to use an incentive rather than a penalty, but the sticks and carrots, um, you know, they do both work. Um, in fact, the median incentive for tobacco cessation participation is about $280 per year per employee. The surcharges are higher, about $520 a year. Um, and those, uh, those do work um, for the, the smokers. 11% of employers make a contribution into a health savings account for people that are not smokers. So um, again, large employers taking the lead, being innovative in this practice. So if other payers, if Medicare and Medicaid and uh, all the exchange plans did things similarly, um, we could really bend the trend on this issue. So. Um, we, I also wanted to talk about a personal experience from the employer side. So I came from a s relatively small large employer, about 5,000 lives. Um, and when I joined, uh, we had just formed this organization from a bunch of small companies. And we identified that 22% of our employees were smokers. So we had implemented a consumer-directed health plan and encouraged people to take a tobacco cessation and a weight management program and do some other healthy behaviors. Um, and we incentivized them with $100 to, to join and $100 to complete a tobacco cessation program. We looked at the data the next year, 3% of our population had participated in that program. And we didn't really have much in the way of success for people quitting. Um, the next year we decided to put in a surcharge. We modeled it. I had actually uh, participated in a national business group on health. I was a member of the business group as a large employer. I sat in on a webinar that they did 
on tobacco cessation programs, how to implement a successful one, how to you know, change the, the culture of your organization. And we modeled our program like other successful employers had done before us. We put in a surcharge. I went to every one of our locations, including Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and Denton, Texas, and State College, Pennsylvania, Visalia, California, and told them that 18 months from now, we're going to be tobacco-free on our sites, where they were still smoking at the reception desk in Winston-Salem at that time. So we put in this program, and I told every employee, we do not want to collect a single surcharge. But we're putting this program in place because we want you to pay attention. The next year, we had 70% participation in that tobacco cessation program, including our union facility in Topeka, Kansas. So that worked. Um, most people did not get the surcharge. They went through this program. They didn't have to quit. They just, you know, just wanted, we just wanted them to try. Then, based again on that webinar and the research, the science, we put an incentive that said, if you stay quit for six months, we're going to reward you with a $200, um, uh, just money in your paycheck. And at 12 months, another $200, because the statistics showed an employer can have that kind of impact if there's another carrot out there. Um, and so over the years that I spent at that large employer, we went from 22% down to under 15. So we were moving the needle. And it's large employers like the members of the business group that are having that impact. In particular, the large employers that we consider best performers, the most innovative organizations in the country. Now, I define them as companies that have a trend that's lower than national average for the last four years. Um, and so those employers have seen about a 1.6% health care cost increase over each of the last four years versus about a 5.2% um, in the nation. And those employers are doing all of the things I mentioned, free medication, free support, incentives, disincentives, um, and so on. But they're also doing things on the broader health perspective. So wellness initiatives, offering telemedicine, particularly in rural areas. They're putting in value-based payments that hold providers accountable for outcomes and better health, price and transparency tools that are helping make people better consumers. They're looking at specialty pharmacy cost management um, and offering a very comprehensive wellness program with physical activity as well as um, health and food, uh, nutrition, and so on. So we hope that other employers take the lead of these best performers um, and that others in the public space, um, the public-private, can do that as well. Thank you. It's, um, I love your examples from Topeka, from Texas, from North Carolina, showing that you're going out to where the action is and, and actually demonstrating that you can move the needle. One of the things that you said, though, that made uh, Matt kind of take a little deep, uh, take a deep breath was um, some employers are talking about not hire, hiring smokers. So um, in, from your perspective and from the perspective of we're trying to build the healthiest nation, we're trying to incentivize and support people, knowing that smoking is an addiction and they need a, a wide range of support. Mm -hmm. What do you say to your colleagues when, when they say that? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's a very small minority of employers that have taken that tact. And from what I understand, many of them are think places like hospitals where, um, you know, they've taken the position that we just, you know, we are a health company like, like CVS. And many of them that say, uh, we'll help you quit. We'll work with the community. We'll do the programs that are in place. You know, we'll offer those in the local community to help improve the health of that group. Those are the stories that I've heard. So uh, yeah, maybe one off here and there where they're just taking that position, but mostly it's um, for, the common, for the common good. Right. Matt, um, you and I both know that the numbers of youth smoking have, some t have been on a s steady decline downward, yet the emergence or the explosion of e-cigarettes um, is troubling at, at the very least. What do you think it's going to take to really deliver on a promise of young people not initiating tobacco use? Um, it's a great question. Um, and the reason for concern about e-cigarettes is that today we have a generation of young people who have actually never witnessed the Marlboro Cowboy um, or the Virginia Slims woman um, or the association 
of tobacco products with a host of these events um, in the irresponsible marketing of e-cigarettes, separate from whether these products have any potential to be helpful, uh, threatens to jeopardize that because a, a critical factor in why we've been successful reducing tobacco use among our children is to disassociate it um, from all the glamour, um, from all of the attributes that a teenager aspires to. Uh, that has taken decades of work to do, and it's critical for us succeeding in, be, in creating a true tobacco-free generation. It's one of the reasons why the CVS action is so important, um, because when you poll young people, you discover that they have an inaccurate um, perception of how many of their peers smoke. They all think more of them smoke. That's because they're still bombarded mm -hmm. with tobacco products and tobacco marketing when they go into so many retail outlets. Um, the elimination of tobacco from those retail outlets um, is a critical component of us communicating to our young people that not only is smoking not the social norm, but that a very tiny fraction of your peers are really doing it. And there is nothing glamorous about it. There is nothing about it that makes you sexier, more independent, uh, more virulent, I'm better able to perform athletic and other um, activities. And so the concern is, is that as we explore what role e-cigarettes may or may not play in our society, is that the irresponsible marketing of those significantly undermines all of those efforts. We really are at a place where it is not um, absurd to be talking about the fact that we can create the next smoke-free generation. If we can eliminate the visibility of tobacco products from the daily existence of our young people, the stores they go into, if we can continue to have society treat tobacco um, as the number one preventable health ha hazard that it is, that you know the, the societal change we've seen um, is is makes it very easy to conceive. But to do that, to do that, we need to t other stores t to follow the lead of CVS for that to happen. We won't do it otherwise. We need the states and the communities that haven't gone smoke free to take that extra step. We need to ensure that businesses um, take the steps um, that we just heard about. Um, if a young person in high school sees that I'm not going to be able to smoke in the business, on the floor of the business, or anywhere near the business, then my smoking is going to be something that's going to make it harder for me to succeed going forward. There are all of those cues that a lot can make it a really, that can make it realistic for us to talk about taking the 15.7% of teenagers who smoke today and turning that into a tiny fraction, and not within our lifetime, but within the next five to seven years. We need to treat it with urgency. We have all the tools to do it. If every retailer did what CVS did, if we could get the movie industry not to face government regulation, but just socially responsible action in eliminating smoking and now e-cigarettes from their movies, um, if we could get government officials to recognize that raising the tax on tobacco products is not only good for the revenue, but it is good for society. Um, it is very easy to conceive of a situation where we come together not um, 50 years from now, but 2020, and see smoking rates well below those numbers. New York City smoking rates among public high school seniors are 8.5%. That happened because the government of New York City simply followed the tried and true evidence-based mechanisms that existed there. Raise the tax, go smoke-free, eliminate smoking in outdoor places where young people are found, and fund tobacco prevention programs that we know work, help people quit. And they have demonstrated that there is no city, there is no state, that can justify having smoking rates among their kids any higher than that. Because if you can do it in New York City, <laughs> you can truly, truly <laughs> do it everywhere. It is not a national nanny to protect our nation's children. I, I would just emphasize the one additional point on, on your comments, and that is 
the, the targeted marketing of e-cigarettes with flavors like cherry and bubble gum, mm -hmm. you know, are clearly pointed at our kids. Yeah. And it's just unconscionable that, that that's allowed. I think um, everyone had a question of who's going to join us here in the empty chair. And I think we'll be being, oh, we're not going to be joined. All right. So um, I do have one question for, our, uh, for Tom, though, in terms of pharmacy. You know, uh, Matt is the only one who has said um, what we know to be true, which is that at this point in America, socioeconomic status is a predictor, mm -hmm. a, a very strong predictor of smoking. And yet when someone goes into the pharmacy, the pharmacist knows everything mm -hmm. because the pharmacist knows all the different drugs you might be taking mm -hmm. for all the different conditions and all the co-occurring conditions. So tell us a little bit about how pharmacists are getting ready to be an active part mm -hmm. of the smoking cessation, a more active part mm -hmm. of smoking cessation in the country. Well, my, uh, my boss today is a guy named Matt Osterhouse in Maquoka, Iowa. And, and Matt's a pharmacist whose pharmacy has never sold cigarettes. And he's actively engaged in his community in, <clears throat> in providing smoking cessation programs and has been for many years. Uh, and there are many, many others like him. Uh, do we have enough pharmacies engaged in that? No, we don't. Uh, we have a long way to go. Uh, but we've, uh, as I said earlier, we have reinvigorated that dialogue. Uh, our organization uh, passed uh, policies uh, in 2010 that uh, uh, basically said that, that uh, schools of pharmacy should not place uh, interns and, and residents and, and uh, uh, pharmacy students in pharmacies that sell cigarettes. Now, that's a policy that was a bold statement, uh, and it made it very difficult uh, for pharmacy schools that were challenged to find sites to, to train their folks, uh, you know, and, and so we're on a path to that, but we're not there yet. Uh, <clears throat> we'll get there. We'll get there. But in 2010, I remember, I remember the dialogue because right after our annual meeting where a House of Delegates met and passed these policies, uh, which were updates to earlier policies, I went to another meeting where I met with a lot of the senior chain execs from all the national chains. And we had this dialogue in 2010 where I was basically saying, listen, I can't tell you how to run your business. That's not what an organization does. But I can tell you that the pharmacists America, of America don't like selling cigarettes. They don't like them in their stores, and they want them out. And, and that was a conversation that, as, as I said, I had with all the senior execs. And one of those guys was Larry Merlot with CVS. And, and so just prior to the announcement by CVS, he and I had a conversation the evening before. And he recalled that conversation. And so I think it, it struck a chord with me that these policies that we pass aren't just words on a page. They, they make a difference. They don't, these things don't happen overnight. Uh, but, but I'm just thrilled, as I, as I said to, to Larry that night, I'm just thrilled with, with the, uh, the stage that's been set. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Admiral Lushniak, I'm thrilled with, you know, to celebrate the 50th anniversary uh, uh, to really re-stimulate this dialogue. Uh, I, we're, we're on the right path. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for a few questions. Please. Um, but take a microphone. Wait for a second. And, and if you'll keep your uh, remarks to a question, not a long comment, so we can hear from our panels, that would be awesome. Thank you. I'm Jim Curry with the Commissioned Officers Association of the U.S. Public Health Service. One of the things that Matt talked about and others have talked about is the, the deglamorization of, of smoking, and I think that that's terrific, and it has to have had an impact on smoking rates. One entity in our own community that has not done that is the Washington Post. Over the last few years, I have seen story after story with wonderful photos of people engaging in particularly cigar smoking and hookah bars. Mm -hmm. Within the last three weeks, there was a story in the Post, in the Washington Post magazine, about uh, a couple out on one of these blind dates. And at the end of it, it showed them lighting up their cigars. And that was the photo that was, that was posted in the Washington Post. In the sports section recently, there was a, a story about the catcher for the Washington Nationals who put a plug of tobacco in his mouth to bring him good luck when he went to the plate. Now, how can we get some entity like the Washington Post, you talk about serving the community, they are doing everything but disserving the community. And I'm just wondering what it will take to get their attention on something like this. 
That's a dangerous question. I'm happy to roam into it. Um, <laughs> Well, I think it's because I take things back to our responsibility. Um, in the Washington Post response to the community, when we're silent um, about our concerns about these issues, when we don't speak up, then um, reporters who lack the sensitivity that we have um, engage in those behaviors. So for me, this isn't an attack on the Washington Post. What I think all of us need to be doing is communicating to the Washington Post that their behavior, unintentional as it is, is having the kind of impact that you're talking about, and that we're not talking about censoring them. We're talking about them being sensitive, that, that where they don't need that for their story, they should eliminate that. But that won't happen without the citizens who read the Washington Post speaking up civilly, thoughtfully, and carefully. And you've also hit um, another point that I'm hoping to get a chance to make anyway, which is, is um, we have an opportunity second to speak up as a community about the use of smokeless tobacco in Major League Baseball. So my hope is, is that when you see a story like that, that you actually communicate to the Washington Nationals and to the Major League players that it's time to knock baseball, to knock smoking and tobacco out of the park. There is no justification for it in our time and day. And my hope is that we will all speak up and take that on as a critical issue. All it will take is for the Major League Players Association to agree to what the owners have already proposed, and that is to come up with a, t a deadline for eliminating the use of smokeless tobacco. And we as a community should be supporting every baseball team and the, play and the owners in doing so. There's no reason to have Ramos um, doing that, let alone talking about doing that. And there are other players on the Washington Nationals who said that they're going to try to quit. Ian Desmond, Steven Strasburg, um, both of that. But we need to recognize that it's hard for them too, and we need to be providing them the support. One of the, one of the things we haven't talked about today is we need to be making sure that they're aware of the cessation services that are available. Um, CBS is a new program for doing that, but new programs around the country for doing that. It's a place where our kids, while we've seen a decline in, in cigarette smoking among our kids, the use of smokeless among teenage boys has remained dead steady, and I hate to say it's going to remain dead steady as long as they see their heroes on the playing field doing it. Hi, uh, Simon McNabb from HHS and CDC. Um, I'm really happy to hear uh, on this talk uh, hitting all the right areas with preventing initiation and promoting cessation and how we do that through a community approach. But in the interest of trying to make cessation services as easy as it is to find a cigarette or a tobacco product, and CVS now has made it easier <laughs> um, to find cessation help, um, I, was, I was encouraged, Sherry, with your numbers that say, that companies that are embracing uh, health are seeing their health care costs rise at a lower rate than others. I've encountered in my experience some skepticism on helping smokers quit because the return on investment um, on that is so far downstream in this day and age with people moving jobs and such um, that it's not a priority. They're like, oh, there's other ways. We'll get them running or eating better. We see that there'll be a return on investment there. And I know there's other reasons to do it than return on investment. But I wanted to know is, have any of you, but I'll start with Sherry, encountered that same, you know, skepticism that, yeah, well, we may help them uh, quit smoking, but we won't see any benefit 5, 10, 20 years down the line. Is that something you've experienced? And if you have, how do we overcome it? Sure. That's an excellent question. So. Um, Employers do vary by industry, so there are differences in what different organizations offer. Um, but in many cases, employers realize they are watering their own garden. So for example, I worked for an, an old line manufacturer where people stayed forever. We got their kids, we got their grandkids, um, and, so, and they were a real community, you know? And so helping each other with weight loss or smoking cessation or whatever problem you have, 
uh, taking walks together, creating uh, fitness teams. Uh, you could not believe the activity when we put in um, a fitness challenge where everybody's walking around with a pedometer and they're, they're working together. So, you know, and employers are using their data. So if an employer looks and says, this is a real problem for us, 77% of my employees are obese and 22% um, smoke, well, they're going to go after that first. And now, and for example, in my employer, um, smokers, we looked at the data, smokers cost us twice what non-smokers did. And you also know it's immediate because when you stop smoking, you don't need to go off campus to go get, get a cigarette and your breaks are much shorter. So there, are, and, and the employers are also embracing the families. They're going out and providing those same services and free uh, nicotine replacement patches and, and on-site uh, assistance for spouses and for children because many of them are on our plans now up to age 26. It does vary by industry. I mean there are some where you know the margins are so tight and they're you know they have a lot of part-time young employees. Th those might not be the places where you're going to get 93 percent but in general employers know for many reasons promoting a healthier more productive workforce, impacting their claims, improving absenteeism and presenteeism, even maintaining or improving just morale. Employees know we care about them. We get out there and say with a passion and with an anger that you know, we want you to get healthier and we're going to help you. They, 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 it matters to them. They feel a better um, trust. And also the, just the competition to provide a competitive benefit practice. I mean, there are some employers that you know, have a richer benefit, benefit package than others. So I, I think it does vary. But there are all good reasons to do this. Um, and, and you're often watering your own garden almost immediately. Hi, Sonia Clay with the American Academy of Family Physicians. Um, our members are very concerned about e-cigarettes. And um, I definitely understand that having any type of meaningful research will take quite a bit of time because the products are very new. But I'm curious what's in the pipeline right now in terms of research, what's taking place in terms of research on e-cigarettes, the impact of secondhand vape, um, and just also whether or not um, e-cigarettes might be effective in any way in terms of promoting cessation. I don't know if you all can answer, but we're very curious about these things. It's an extraordinarily challenging question um, because um, without meaningful government regulation, what we have seen is a proliferation of science um, on all sides of the issue um, that candidly none of which stands up to rigorous um, scientific scrutiny or standards. Um, we talk about e-cigarettes as if it's a single product. In many studies treated as a single product and yet there are hundreds of different variations, each of which change every day. Would you allow research on a drug um, to tell you whether or not it's safe or effective if you actually didn't know what the substance is and yet most of the studies done fall into that category. So the quickest answer I would give to you is it's up to all of us to push the Food and Drug Administration as quickly and as rapidly as possible to both assert its jurisdiction over e-cigarettes and then to get hold on the science so that the type of science that's being done is the kind of science that we can rely upon in making decisions so that we have some sort of vehicle to rein in the kind of marketing that we're seeing, the use of flavors. You know, the e-cigarette industry claims suddenly that cherry vanilla is critical for someone smoking, uh, for someone quitting smoking. Um, it has the same sense of credibility as when the CEO stood up and said um, their products aren't addictive. But the reason for giving FDA jurisdiction is so that we would have an objective independent, scientifically based decision making. We need to hold FDA accountable. They can't take years to do this because there's way too much at stake in how it gets resolved. And we're not going to have meaningful answers until we have some kind of government regulation that controls the kind of studies, the kind of products, and how they're marketed. You, you, could, take an, you could take another approach and just look simply at the substance. And, and nicotine is a poison. We know it's a poison. Uh, there's no ambiguity about that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what are we doing, allowing our kids to buy poisons? What are, you know, what are we doing? Um, 
you know, Admiral Lushniak mentioned that uh, it's not a feeling. We have the science. Uh, we have the science about about nicotine. We know it's a poison. But I got a feeling that um, that we all in this room know that this is a bad idea. And you know, I don't think waiting for the science to decide whether e-cigarettes should be sold in pharmacies or not, you know. It just doesn't make sense to me. I don't think we need to wait. Well, there's a whole host of things we know we can do and if the, and while we're waiting for the FDA to do it. Um, you know, every, every state and locality um, not only should ban the sale of e-cigarettes to young people, but to apply the full force of the rules to ensure th that they aren't sold, um, which means applying the full rules that apply to tobacco products. While we're figuring out what's in the vape, nobody should be exposed to them. Um, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. We don't use our humans as guinea pigs uh, in other fields, and that's basically what we're being asked to do here. And that will also prevent um, e-cigarettes becoming the new social norm within our communities. Um, we can ensure that local stores, which have the authority with regard to purely local forms of advertising, take steps so that they're not glamorized in those communities. So there's a number of steps that we as community leaders can ensure that our local communities take even while we're waiting for answers to some of those bigger questions. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have to be sitting in the sideline during, during this period of time. And lastly, we need to be speaking out um, ab about that so that the extent to which there are these flavors out there, the extent to which movie stars are now um, serving as spokespeople for these sorts of things, the extent to which we see it on social media. Um, becomes a national debate and a national dialogue. You know, the Senate Commerce Committee held a hearing on this issue that received a great deal of attention. We need to sure, ensure that that dialogue goes on in every one of our communities. Sherry, I, know it's, I, uh, Sherry, I know it's something you're... Uh Yes, So, and also on commercials. I, for the first time this past weekend watching football, there were at least a half a dozen um, in like the first few hours. But w our members were asking those same questions. What do we do about e-cigarettes? And so uh, at the end of last year, we put out Adjust the Facts and, an and answered just those questions, that it's not proven and, you, you know, it is a poison and other countries have banned it. And, um, and encourage them to treat them like any other tobacco products, to include them in their definition of not being a smoker, um, and most have embraced that. So, um, I, and this is one of our most downloaded uh, documents. So employers are, are asking that question, and then that was one of the reasons why we had a webinar and had like 250 employers sit on that call mm -hmm. to find out what others are doing. So it's, it's really important to share that, those facts. Yeah, that's interesting. So I'll just be very brief. Um, but consistent with what all of the panelists said, uh, without a compelling story to suggest that e-cigarettes somehow help people to quit, and with a very, very clear evidence that, it, that nicotine's a poison, it's a no-brainer for us. So we don't, we don't sell e-cigarettes. We have no plans to sell e-cigarettes. Um, but our approach was, more of a scientific one. We want to wait for the evidence. We want to see some shred of compelling science that suggests that there's something beneficial or useful that comes from these products. And that is not something that we feel like we've seen to date. Hi. Um, my name is uh, Woody Kessel. I'm a pediatrician with the C. Everett Coop Institute at Dartmouth. And I certainly know uh, channeling Dr. Coop, he would certainly want me to say thank you for the courage uh, and passion and commitment that CVS has brought to this conversation and this movement. Uh, I think all the Surgeons General would indeed applaud your effort. My question has to do with uh, tobacco labeling, the cigarette package labeling, and where that stands. Um, given the controversy about what's happened with that. And more uh, specifically, we had the pleasure of Surgeon General Lushniak here, and the latest labeling eliminates the words Surgeon General's warning from uh, the cigarette package. And I'm curious, one, about the status of the new labels, two, how is it that it was felt that with the issues of the science that we know about how people can make a difference in the lives of young people, 
how it, how it is that the word Surgeon General is no longer part of the new label. Well, I'm going to ask Matt to handle the answer to this question. You've asked a highly politicized question um, that is both an issue of advocacy, science, and policy. And Matt? Uh, let me answer the easier one first, which is the status. Um, the legislation giving FDA jurisdiction over tobacco products also mandated um, that FDA um, propose a rule requiring that um, warning labels covering the top 50 percent of the front and back of a cigarette package, including pictures, graphic warnings. Um, FDA did that and did it on time, and uh, the D.C. courts declared that the pictures were so inflammatory that they somehow violated the First Amendment rights of the tobacco companies. Um, we can debate the merits of that. Um, that put the onus back on FDA um, to go back and um, develop a new set of pictures that were both compliant with the statute and that could pass constitutional muster. Um, FDA hasn't done it yet. It's one of those issues that has now sat for way too long. And um, I, it, it's actually a frustration. The US currently has among the weakest, least visible warnings of any country in the entire globe. Um, and yet FDA has the statutory mandate to do the right thing on that. Um, Th there is no non-controversial way to answer your question about the Surgeon General's um, labeling. Um, I, I can tell you just what I know, which is not the full picture, which is that there were a number of studies that were done that tested out um, effectiveness of different labels. Um, and the labels that were in the, the legislation that don't include the name of the Surgeon General were the result of a number of polls and studies that were done that showed that the label actually was more effective um, as Congress drafted it. Um, and um, one can debate that back and forth, and I, I understand that. But that was, that was, as I understand it, the rationale for it. Um, other countries that have considered similar issues that don't have, quote, the Surgeon General, but have other prominent people um, have found that the studies Reach this, the studies there reach the same conclusion that the specific definitive statement, as a matter of fact, had a greater effect than if it came from an individual, even a credible individual um, in this case. And um, uh, unfortunately, in the United States today, while we all treat the Surgeon General as an incredibly prominent, incredibly credible individual, when you look at the population we're trying to reach, it doesn't have the same effect um, with it. So again, um, I understand the controversy with it, but that was the rationale behind the decision making. FDA currently's task is um, its initial rounds of labels are, are set by statute and need to be imposed. Thereafter, FDA is given the authority to test out different labels um, for pure effectiveness so that labeling be done as scientifically as everything else, and where, where that would shake out in that would depend on the data. Okay, we have one question over on this end of the room. Hi, my name is Emily Gildy, and I'm from Baltimore City Health Department. And, um, you know, health equity is really at the heart of what we do, and uh, my question is, how can we tailor some of these strategies to work specifically within uh, economically uh, disadvantaged communities? Because we know those are the folks who are having the uh, highest rates of tobacco use. Uh, one thing I might observe is that uh, there are pharmacies in every community, uh, as, uh, certainly in the underserved areas, uh, that serve often as a health center for that, that area. They're the place that people go to get questions answered on, on their health needs uh, and are a natural place for <clears throat> uh, folks who are interested in quitting to uh, ask those questions. They see the nicotine replacement therapy products in the pharmacies as well as the cigarettes, unfortunately, in many cases. Uh, so, so they're a natural place to begin the discussion. Uh, but without support for the smoking cessation programs, uh, what those patients get, if, if they're motivated enough to buy an NRT product, is a 30-second finger wagging that says, you know, good luck with this, or you know, work hard at it, and off they go. They don't get the coaching. They don't get the behavioral modification techniques. They don't get the, uh, the uh, dialogue and the ongoing connection that, that we found is so essential to help people stay uh, uh, abstinent. 
So, you know, part of the answer is, uh, you know, put us in, we're ready to play. Yeah, I mean, one other thing I would add is, um, so as, as Tom's getting at, pharmacies, our pharmacy in particular, has really built uh, sophisticated programs to try to help patients quit. Um, and we're in patients' neighborhoods. We're easy to access. Uh, we, um, part of, from a, from a city or state standpoint, making sure that there aren't financial barriers to those services could be one alternative to try to make sure that that, um, that, uh, that they're not denied the services that could be essential to try to make sure that they get the care that they need. Um, but I feel like there's actually a host of things sort of coming together right now to address those disparities. A lot of the financial incentives that are in place around sort of taxes are, are disproportionately challenge those that are vulnerable. And, you know, maybe that's a good thing if, if those, you know, it's helping them to quit. And, and when you start thinking about how to all, the, all the different pieces come together and the fact that there is in, in the neighborhood, in, in each, just about everybody's patient's neighborhood, a place to get help. Um, if we can make sure that the funding system works, uh, I think we're, we're sort of building an infrastructure that could be really helpful. Hi, Cheryl Austin Kasnoff from NORC, University of Chicago. I have two quick questions. One is, given what appears to be the very positive publicity that came out of CVS's announcement, have we seen sort of others follow, and if not, why? Or are we waiting to see sort of the next great corporation step up and do that? It doesn't seem to be hitting the press anyway. And my second question was, there was a very brief reference to Medicaid, but the Affordable Care Act created dramatic expansions in coverage related to tobacco, particularly for the populations we're talking about today, the low income, the disparate populations. Not every state obviously has expanded Medicaid, but pregnant women, Medicare, some of the incentives that you're talking about, Sherry, were enhanced as well by the Affordable Care Act. What does that mean? Why aren't we seeing sort of a dramatic call to action as a result of, of those expansions? Well, one of the challenges for, for our community, that is pharmacists, is that, uh, and I'm, I mentioned this earlier, we, we are eager to be part of team-based care, which is a big component of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and um, to that end, uh, eager to partner with our colleagues in family practice and primary care and, and the like. Um, one of the challenges is that we as pharmacists in, are not considered providers in Medicare. And because we're not providers, we're not eligible to provide those services. Unless, as I mentioned, we're uh, in a physician's office providing them uh, incident to the visit to the physician. Uh, we have no interest in, in, uh, in uh, pulling those services out of physician offices, uh, but there's, there's an unmet need out there that uh, uh, will take some, some policy change to, uh, uh, to get greater adoption in the communities. Well, I want to I wanna challenge you to answer the first part of the question, which is CVS did something that by anybody's standards was uh, a game changer, dramatic, and highly admirable. Um, their backroom conversation that you're hearing about others following your lead? Um, and, and if not, how can we um, answer Matt's call for voting with our feet to reward CBS for your decision and, and helping to build a groundswell of pressure that all retailers become responsible retailers? I mean, you've broken ground, but we all collectively have a role to play. We're not CEOs, but we purchase things every day. So yes. how can you... Uh, what can you tell us about how we might help move the needle towards mass, uh, all, all retail being responsible? So I've, I, I certainly could not um, guess what folks are speaking about in a boardroom or in the CEO's office at, our, at other retail pharmacies. Um, publicly, the response has not been that they're planning to stop selling cigarettes. Um, we have had wonderful 
press. That wasn't the motivation for this. The motivation was that we thought it was the right thing to do. And, uh, but we're grateful for that good press. And we're grateful that people seem to appreciate the fact that what we're doing is valuable and meaningful and progressive and in all of our best interests. And I think what you're getting at is exactly right. If the more folks choose with their feet, um, you know, if you watch sort of these, what's happening in the NFL or in these other settings, it's, it, it is, it's money that talks. And if we start seeing, you know, sort of an overwhelming uh, group of patients that are coming, that are migrating to us because they like our policy and they like the way we run our business, that will, of course, make us very happy. And we think it'll allow us to provide better care to them. And it might take something like that to, for them ultimately to, for our competitors actually to change. Um, that said, I would bet, and I think, Tom, you actually got at it, um, that if you ask the pharmacists at our competitors if they want to be selling cigarettes, overwhelmingly the answer is no. And, you know, there's, there are challenges in moving large for-profit companies in ways that, you know, immediately have, um, have financial implications to shareholders. So, um, you know, it's, we understand it's not an easy decision, but we hope um, that this has sort of started some momentum around others doing the same thing. I think I can, can I be, I think there's some concrete things we can do. Um, Good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Give us our to-do list now. Well, you know, I mean, let's be, let's be concrete. I mean, we, we've heard, you know, um, about two cities that have banned the sale of tobacco yeah. products and pharmacists. Well, that two should be 200. Um, and so all of us who work at the state and local level, who have organizations who work at the state and local level, ought to be going in and talking to our city council people and mayors and saying, if these people won't do it on their own, then let's do it for them. Second, um, we all belong to organizations um, with large membership. I mean, it ought to be our organizational policy. Um, to support those businesses that support public health, and we ought to be very visible about that. Um, third, um, we're all citizens, um, and we do talk. We heard criticism of the Washington Post. If there were 30 letters in the Washington Post saying we all um, should treat um, businesses that don't sell tobacco as the only responsible retailers, um, that word would get out so that, you know, we're not silent voices, that we can uh, impact uh, that um, we can reach out to the media, we can meet with editorial boards to say that um, one business here has sh set a shining example. Not only should they be rewarded, but frankly, we should call out all of our other businesses to join with them as well so that we have a concrete set of voices. And we all belong to, I think many of us probably belong to parent organizations. Mm. Um, so that this is an issue that parent organizations ought to take on. Parents and grandparents who care about their children should treat this as an issue that's um, directly relevant to their own children. Um, and we should make it easy for our members to find tobacco-free retailers. I, we have a project that we, where we intend to do that, and I'm hoping others will join with us if there's no ownership, pride of ownership in that. So I think there's a number of concrete things. We're not passive players in this. We can drive this agenda just as we've driven other agendas um, in the past. Um, and it'll maybe, it'll, uh, normally these things start slow. CVS has given us a running start on it. Um, but I would think that with, with all the organizations that are represented in this room, um, that if, if we do what we're capable of doing, every business will say, this is something we have to do. Um, as we move forward, and it will quickly become the social norm. The first airline that went smoke-free was attacked and challenged and, thought, and lost business initially, um, and today it's inconceivable that there was ever a world. Um, we heard the same thing about restaurants that did it initially. Inconceivable. Um, candidly, when APHA goes to New Orleans this fall, um, there will be legislation before the New Orleans City Council this, um, later this year for New Orleans to take the final step to go 100% um, smoke-free and tobacco-free in its bars and candidly in its casinos. We should make sure that every one of our organizations who goes to New Orleans make sure that the bar owners and, and, and others know that, that we're not coming back <laughs> unless they take that step. 
um, and we should let, make sure that the city council knows it and that all of our organizations speak up in New Orleans. There is no reason that New Orleans shouldn't follow suit with all of the other um, cities in the country. And, and we can do that. And if New Orleans does it, it will flow through the rest of the South. Hi, I'm Marty Wasserman, and I'm Dr. Benjamin's older brother, not from Chicago. <laughs> and, and, and just picking up on, on what you were saying and talking about concrete, I'm thinking back uh, 20 years when we started Smoke Free Maryland, and it started in a panel like this and an opportunity. And I'm thinking what I heard with this group today, 100 plus strong, and a small thing, the Washington Post, maybe we could go around the panel and just some comments from the audience, the concrete steps that we could take and set a timeline. When, what can we do? Uh, Jeff Bezos and Amazon, probably not going to stop Amazon from selling its products, but what can we do with the members of this room to, to maybe take some action as a result of this discussion this morning and get the Washington Post to do a little bit better than they're doing with reducing using Washington Redskins on the sports page? <laughs> That's a challenge. I, I, got, I got the challenge, Marty, so thank you very much. Um, but I am pleased. Not the Redskins. Not the Redskins. This, red is, this <laughs> is on, toba on, toba on tobacco use or smoke, uh, smokeless shoes. No, I, I think you're exactly right. But I'm going to pass the microphone to Susan uh, Poland, who's going to give us some I'm taking ones. the prerogative of the microphone and responding to some of the questions from Twitter. And as you can guess, one of the biggest issues has been e-cigarettes. And it's been all over the place. And for the record, some of you have been personally attacked on Twitter, and some of you have been very well supported. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the issue really is, um, I think that the dichotomy that's come up has been, does, is there any value in e-cigarettes as a step down from tobacco? And are we misleading kids by telling them that, that, that e-cigarettes have no value versus what do we know about e-cigs as, as truly being a step down when it comes to using tobacco? All right, we're and, gonna we're gonna let Tom take the first crack at that since he represents the AP small A to A. Yeah. Well, thank you, and uh, and it's a fair question. Uh, you know, as teenagers look for uh, uh, look for answers, uh, and, and uh, you know, our organization took a po adopted a policy last year that basically said the evidence is still out. Uh, we don't know, and while we don't know, uh, you know, we're going to be very cautious about. Uh, acceptance or or any other uh, uh, positive look at, at e-cigarettes. So, uh, you know, we're we're sort of a wait and see approach. But uh, meanwhile, uh, encouraging folks to be very vigilant and careful about it. So, uh, it's a poison. Um, you know, there's no way there's no way to say that it's a good thing necessarily. It may be better than smoked tobacco, uh, but we don't really even know that. So, we're being very cautious about it. Sherry, your group has a fact sheet, just the facts about e-cigarettes. You just had a webinar, over 200 people um, tuned in to have the conversation. What are you hearing asked, and how are you responding? Oh, it is a really good question. Last week on the call, we had one member. It was a, um, it was a, a health system that had banned cigarettes on its, <coughs> on its campus, but hadn't banned e-cigarettes because uh, they, they understood it was less toxic or they, they had taken uh, that position with their employees that it would be better to avoid the secondhand smoke. So uh, they, they had that policy in place and now they were trying to figure out what to do with uh, moving people away from that as well. So they had taken that position and now uh, wanted to make that change. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, how do you go about communicating that? And so the other members on the phone shared their best practices about getting, going ahead 18 months or, or a year to say this policy is going to change and um, making sure that they moved in that direction. So we're, we're supporting each other with success stories. So somebody else said, we have a smoking hut. Everybody at 1010 in the morning goes over there and smokes. It's really a bad message to send. How do we fix that? So again, you know, how to make sure that you're a good partner, a good neighbor, because then once you've banned smoking on your facility, people go over to the next place and then they're smoking there and their butts are on the ground. So it was all about sharing with each other the best practices and the stories and the, um, you know, how other people have succeeded in making those changes. So the e-cigarettes, most again, are treating them the same. Some are not. About 
uh, about 20% are silent on it in their, in their policy. They just haven't gotten to updating it or, or changing it. So they're looking at making those changes going forward. It, it's really about finding the best practices and, and uh, tapping into those. Matt, the question was, are e-cigarettes a pathway to cessation? From the tobacco-free kids' point of view, what, what would you say? Um, the science is still out, and, and that's the critical question. And the um, comments that Susan talked about focused on young people. So when we're talking about young people, we're, ta we're not talking about an already five-year, 10-year, 15-year addicted smoker. And I think the message for young people really does need to be clear, which is there's no safe use of nicotine. Um, that as a young person, you shouldn't be starting any nicotine-based product. You're not in the position of the 30-year-old addicted smoker who we're trying to find a cessation solution for um, with regard to that. So the issue is, is it less ad addictive than, less harmful than smoking a pack a day Marlboro? Well, for a 14-year-old and 15-year-old, that's not really the right discussion to be having. Um, the right discussion to be having is, is nicotine is particularly harmful for um, an adolescent um, in an adolescent brain, and therefore we should be using all of our efforts with that population to discourage the use of any tobacco or nicotine-based product with regard to it. And so it's, it's a careful messaging that I think has to be there. You know, the second issue that relates to that is uh, there's a lot of debate. Do we yet know, is, is it a gateway to eliminating smoking or is it a gateway to starting smoking? When we're talking about kids, it almost doesn't matter. If it's a gateway to using nicotine, that's something we should be doing everything we can to stop as it goes. And then the, the last gateway question is, um, we do have science to show that if it leads to dual use, in other words, someone just reduces the number of cigarettes they smoke but doesn't quit, and then goes on to a long period of dual use, and, and the recent data shows that dual use is a very significant percentage of the population that that does not produce a substantial public health. That, that we don't have to wait the jury on, is if it's being used to sustain smoking while they're using this as well, that we as a society have not gained a public health benefit. The only public health benefit will come is if it can be shown that it actually helps people get off cigarettes altogether with regard to that. And on that one, the jury is still out. I, I think there's an important point to be made, though, without judging young smokers. Uh, and folks who are already smoking, uh, you know, we can't wag our fingers at them and say you shouldn't be smoking in the first place. We have to say what can we do to help. And while the evidence is still out on e-cigarettes, it's not still out on nicotine replacement therapies of other types. You know, nicotine gum, patches, etc. work for young people just as well as they do for adults, if not better. So I think, you know, there are answers for them uh, that are proven. Uh, and that go that aren't uh, offering the same uh, uh, perhaps deleterious deleterious effects of, of e-cigarettes. Well, obviously, CVS has a very specific point of view. You're not selling. Um, do you have anything else you want to say to our questioners on Twitter about e-cigarettes? Um, well, I, I think our policy is clear that we uh, don't see we don't. We haven't seen compelling evidence to suggest that e-cigarettes are a clear treatment for people who are trying to stop smoking combustible cigarettes. Uh, and in the absence of that clear piece of, of clinical data, we can't see a, we, we would not see a path towards, uh, towards using them. Great. So I'm going to give each of the panelists uh, two minutes. So it's going to be rapid fire, two minutes each. Um, your last word on. Um, how will we deliver on a promise of a tobacco-free generation? And I'm going to start with Sherry. Ah, okay. So, um, you know, I looked at our statistics, and the employers in our uh, survey population have 13% tobacco use. Um, and so less than the national average, but still double digits. Um, and I think that, the, you know, I mentioned 93% of large employers offer these programs, but more could do it more could uh, create the culture of health that would help them and support them using all the techniques we just discussed. We have to figure out the right way 
to make sure that the employees, when they're ready to quit, when we find those folks that are moving along that, that uh, spectrum, are ready to quit, that they remember that those techniques are, are there. So keeping it in front of them is really important. Um, and you know, supporting all of the initiatives that we just discussed, like uh, retailers that, uh, that aren't selling. So I think it's a combination of, of more of what we're doing and uh, you know, using all of those best practices, following the companies that have made a really good impact, um, and just moving forward with uh, keeping those cultures of health um, in their organization with, you know, with all of the new uh, technologies that are available um, and making sure that it's, it's all tobacco products as well. Great. And Tom, what is the role of pharmacists in yeah. creating this culture of health? Well, so in, in solving any problem or addressing any issue, it's always first what and then how. Uh, and we know the what. We know that, that we need to stop smokers and stop smoking. There's good science on how to help quitters quit. Let's employ it. Pharmacists are capable providers in an often incapable system. We're eager to help the public with smoking cessation programs. These services need coverage in partnership with government, employers, insurance plans, health systems, and physician groups to afford quitters access in Medicare and team-based care to improve public health. Many pathways to quit lines, as every state and the CDC host them. These quit lines need more professionals engaged at the other end to help smokers quit and pharmacists are ready to serve. Techniques uh, identified by HHS such as ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange, the five A's, are recommended by HHS and studied by Bach et al. and shown to increase chances of success. Studies support increased involved involvement by, by pharmacists in smoking cessation, and we know that face-to-face -face is the best approach. But even brief counseling can be effective for some. The HHS guidelines for treating tobacco use and dependence provide 10 key guideline recommendations and emphasize practical counseling, social support, and effective medication use. Most experts agree that a combination of face-to-face -face coaching and medication significantly improves success and the public health payoff was recognized over 50 years ago. Put us in, coach. Pharmacists are ready to play. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And the last word on our panel we'll give to Matt Myers. Matt, the role of advocates. Advocates have helped us dream a dream of uh, a United States where no child begins tobacco use, where every smoker has access to the cessation support services and products they need. Tell us what advocates will do, help us to dream and do in the next century. Well, first I want to say I, I'm incredibly encouraged um, with all the progress we've made. Um, both Sherry and Will's presentations demonstrate for the first time that we're looking seriously at how the private sector um, and we can all work together. And we will only really succeed if we do that. Um, we have the tools. We need to speak up. What we have lacked is the political will um, going forward. Um, as Dr. Lushniak said, um, our key is translating the science we have into the action we know we can. And we have demonstrated models of success around the country. What I think is exciting about today is that it is clear that leaders in the private sector have stepped forward. And they can send a different kind of message um, to a different audience um, impacting a very broad range of people. And it is exactly the kind of compliment we've needed. What we as advocates, and I'm going to not use the word advocates, what we as citizens need to do is that um, those private sector members who step forward become winners in every sense. Um, and so if you want to know what's the new thing that we can do that we haven't been doing, we can make sure that every private sector member that Sherry represents who does the right thing is rewarded every day in every way. And we can make sure that absolutely the thing that happens is that the one company who has stepped forward and literally stepped out on the limb um, is a winner um, in the end of the day. Because the best way to ensure that the other businesses follow is if CVS is unquestionably perceived to have taken not only the right step from a public health standpoint, from, but the smartest business step everybody could have. We want to come back here in two years and have every pharmacy saying, why didn't we do it first? 
uh, not why did it take us so long to do it. Um, and that will only happen if we as citizens take the action to absolutely guarantee that that is deemed to be the social norm from a business standpoint, from an ethical standpoint, and every other standpoint in our community. It has to be the norm. And that's, it's really up to us to make sure that happens. Great. Thank you. Please join me in thanking this distinguished panel. And now I think we'll hear from Will. Thank you. Uh, well, I wonder if anyone else here is as inspired and excited about the prospects here as I am. I suspect you are. You know, when, when hearing this panel speak and to sort of perceive the sense of alignment here, alignment between health professionals, the pharmacists, between the public, between advocates, uh, the public sector in general, the private sector, large businesses. Uh, it just seems like there is a, uh, there's really a path here for us to collaborate, for us to put our heads together, for us to build a momentum together. And reducing, eliminating cigarettes in, in pharmacies is one piece, but helping to get to a, uh, a tobacco-free society is our goal and you know this this really felt like we're starting to lay out some steps that begin to make sense so I'm really um, grateful to have had the opportunity to listen and to participate um, one critical step that I wanted just to focus on briefly that we've taken at CVS is we've realized it's not enough just to stop selling cigarettes that there are still a lot of people who smoke not seven out of every 10 people who do smoke want to quit. Um, and we want to be a place that is in the neighborhood of these smokers where they can come to us and get help. We want them to see us as sort of their neighborhood partner. We're leveraging about 7,700 retail stores, 900 minute clinics, a pharmacy benefits management company that insures about 65 million Americans. We're leveraging all of our resources, really as, aggressive, as aggressively as we can, to try to identify and to patients that need help and to tailor appropriate programs for them. So our program has four critical components. There's an assessment of readiness, education around uh, smokers tools and information they need to quit medication support nicotine replacement other smoking cessation meds to help curb the desire and then as as tom was getting at the the critical role of motivation of coaching and of the relationship around uh smoking cessation and as you noted you know the the evidence is really clear that that can double the the smoking cessation rate when that personal touch is part of the interaction. But we also know that it takes on average seven times for people who are trying to quit to actually quit, and we want to make sure that everyone keeps on quitting. So since we announced our plan, it's been really interesting. There's, there's, there's been a lot of discussion around people's personal stories, their personal stories about someone in their family that quit or that didn't quit or something, some personal experience that they've had with someone who smokes that ma that's really made this a very personal campaign. And folks have responded in ways that bring them back to very sort of salient relationships in their own lives. And I'll just, I'd just like to, if you'd indulge me for a moment, I'll tell you one, uh, one of mine. When I first started in medical school, I, early in my medical school career, I, was, I met a patient uh, on the oncology service, and she just had a lung resection, and she was, re she was receiving chemotherapy when I met her, and we had a conversation about her illness, and she spoke at length about 
how ashamed she was. You know, her, she really felt as though she was responsible for her illness. Uh, and it was very hard for her to talk about it. And that really stuck with me, how ashamed she felt. And then later that evening, I went and did my rounding on the six patients that I was following at the time. And then uh, I left the hospital that night. I walked out the front door, and I saw that very same patient standing in front of the hospital. She had a bag of chemotherapy hanging. She was receiving her chemotherapy, and she was smoking a cigarette. And we looked at each other, and we didn't say a word. And it just really sort of emphasized the fact that this is a hard problem to kick, but this is something we all, all, all need to put our heads around together. So um, I just really want to thank everybody who, who joined us here today. I think this has been a really, really productive and useful meeting. Um, and I hope we can keep this momentum going. Um, you know, I think uh, Matt was trying to sort of get to a very discrete set of, of, of action activities, uh, and others were um, around, around how, we, how we speak directly to the Washington Post. Uh, but I, think, I do think it's really, you know, it would, be, it would be great if we could walk away from this meeting with a clear sense of how all of us who work in different settings and potentially come from different backgrounds, but all have a shared and profound interest in the same result, how we keep this momentum going and continue to work together. Uh, I do would, you know, just one sincere thank you to our speakers who really made an extraordinary um, effort to, and were wonderful communicators from your perspectives. Thank you, thank you. Uh, a thank you to our Surgeon General, who I believe has left. He's got much more important things to do. Um, but his, I think his words, and particularly his comments around how we, we kind of all have to be friends in this, that we're all on the same team, and we really have to see it the same way, I thought was really salient. Uh, and of course, a thank you uh, to Dr. Benjamin, to the APHA for bringing, the, bringing us all together, and for all you do to help keep all Americans healthy. So thank you very much. So as always, I get the back cleanup, and I guess I have my to-do list. So um, a letter to the New Orleans um, City Council uh, when we go there for the annual meeting in November, done. Um, a letter to the Washington Post. Susan, maybe we can get that out before I leave um, tomorrow. Um, and, you know, a, a thank you to, um, obviously, to CVS and to Will and Judy and Marissa, our colleagues here who from CVS who have been helping us uh, work on this problem each and every day. Um, thank you to our friends at the Glover Park Group and to my staff. Would you get my staffs um, um, over there? I think I see Carlene and Susan and Daniel and um, um, I see Mighty back there and, and others. Just give them a great round of applause for their, for their work putting this session together. And always our panel and our speakers, if you give them a great round of applause, I thank you very much for that. And, and so in closing, I just um, want to say that, you know, we've got 400 and plus thousand people who die each and every year from the number one preventable cause of death. And we've got a lot of work to do. We've, we've, uh, um, we've done a lot here uh, over the last uh, 50 years. Um, but as the, the new Legacy Foundation ad says, um, let's finish the job. Thank you very much. And there's food. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>